My name is Sue Dulick. I'm an, on the board of the ICFRC and today's host for the program. As you probably noticed that the clock is, is not working, so uh, bear with us. We'll, we'll keep everybody on time and finish up here a little bit before 1 o'clock as always. The ICFRC hosts community programs to address topics of international interest. We thank our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forums possible. Uh, since uh, the Super Bowl winner uh, that year it was Miami uh, Dolphins. Actually, they lost to the Washington uh, Redskins. Uh, what was interesting about that game is the most valuable player was John Riggins, who went on a couple years later to drunkenly tell Justice O'Connor to loosen up a bit. <laughs> but that year was 1983. I want to acknowledge our university and community sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, and of course the Stanley UI Foundation support organizations for their key crucial financial support. And also today's special sponsors, Jim and Pat Fgraf, the UICCU, and Hazel Seba. I also thank City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4. Uh, or 118-2 in the UI Library's digital archives. Over 220 ICFRC podcasts can now be found on iTunes. It is my pleasure to introduce Blake Roop, uh, who, as I said earlier, is a sustainable water development co coordinator at the College of Engineering and newly appointed manager of the Office of Sustainability and Environmental uh, in the environment at Iowa. Uh, Blake received her undergraduate and master's degree here at the University of Iowa. The master's degree was in international studies and she focused her research on the different human drivers behind waste proliferation and marine debris presence. She uh, conducted projects in several areas of the field from conducting field research in quantifying and classifying the waste problem all the way to identifying and critiquing systemic institutional obstacles to improving the waste situation. After graduation, Blake utilized her passion for conservation and skills in web design uh, and development to build a mobile conservation and sustainability apps known as ReApp. She has taken part in the Iowa Startup Accelerator in Cedar Rapids and was named a finalist for the Iowa Women of Innovation Award. As a conservationist, Blake is passionate about promoting clean water and community engagement to improve our environmental health. Please join me in welcoming Blake Roop. Wow, hello, and thank you for that really warm welcome. I appreciate it. And thanks to everybody for coming out today um, to hear me and invite me to come and talk about garbage in our oceans. There's not very many times I get invited to talk about it, so I'm really excited to have that opportunity today. Um, and I will say there are some pretty graphic images as we get into this, um, so apologies if you're enjoying your lunch at that time, um, just <laughs> FYI. Um, okay, so as we get started, I want to start off with a story. Oh, this will work. There we go. On March 8, 2014, at 12.42 a.m., Malaysia Air Flight 370 took off from Kuala Lumpur International Airport en route to Beijing, where it was expected to land at 6.30 in the morning. 30 minutes later, the captain replied to air traffic control with the words, Good night, Malaysia 370. The flight was tracked by military radar crossing the Malay Peninsula and then last located over the Andaman Sea which is incredibly off course when you're heading to Beijing, just up there. Then, oddly, the, airport took an, or the airplane took an immediate left turn and started flying immediately south towards the southern Indian Ocean. Six hours later, after no contact with the pilots of the missing flight, uh, the plane itself missed its arrival time in Beijing, which prompted Malaysia Airlines to release a press statement saying that they had lost this plane. It was officially lost. The last successful contact was made at about 8 a.m. with the plane, and it ended up um, triggering a satellite in Perth um, that ended up seeing where its location was, which they thought was somewhere along this arc. And then that was the last communication. They thought that might be when they either ran out of fuel or um, crashed into the ocean. It's a far cry from Beijing. 
Nobody had any clue where the plane went and why it went off course. This began one of the most extensive and expensive searches for a plane in aviation history and would go on to become aviation's greatest mystery. So for three years, a joint task force searched for any debris that they could, uh, they could find, and um, hopefully find anything that would lead them to the aircraft and its passengers. Even though debris that could be potentially linked to the flight started showing up along the eastern um, coast of Africa and Tasmania, the search remained unsuccessful. Millions and millions of dollars were poured into searching for this plane. However, while looking for the debris, rescuers, crews, and media found a lot of false alarms. And this, these false alarms were in the form of floating garbage in the ocean. So they would waste a lot of resources um, when they would find something in the air, they would go down to the ocean and see what it was, and it would be a mattress, it would be a house roof, it would be a car, it would be house walls, wood pallets, things like that, but no remains of, airplane, of the airplane. And it wasn't just a little bit of garbage that they would find. They were finding a lot of it. Um, this, tragedy, this tragedy, though, became one of the first times that mainstream media brought attention and pointed a spotlight on the issue that researchers and scientists have been um, yelling about into the void for decades, which is that we are in the midst of a global crisis when it comes to garbage in our oceans. So what is marine debris? So we're talking about uh, plastics in our ocean today. What does that really mean? Well, according to the science and the research, um, you're gonna see marine debris defined as any sort of human created waste that ends up in a waterway. So that could be a lake, that could be the sea, that could be the ocean, that could be a river. Um, and in the research, it has a lot of different names, including <laughs> marine debris, marine litter, and flotsam. It accumulates in every portion of the waterway that exists. So this includes on the water surface, in the water column, along river banks, in the center of gyres, and even on the ocean floor. Marine debris has several different forms, um, from the microplastics that, and microbeads that make our face washes, our body scrubs, and our toothpaste quote unquote effective, all the way to debris that enters from the ocean, like in natural disasters, like earthquakes, tsunamis, and more. So from the size of tiny beads all the way to the size of homes, the issue itself is massive and intense, but it's also incredibly nuanced because dealing with all of these different types of debris um, takes a lot of different research and scientists to work this out. So uh, the most dangerous and prolific of this garbage is plastic, which is what I'm here to talk about today. So it's dangerous to, to animals and humans in a lot of different ways. Plastics themselves are pervasive, they're persistent, and they're increasingly on the rise. They have a long shelf life, which means that we're going to be seeing them in our environment for months, weeks, decades, and even centuries to come. So if it's so dangerous, what is plastic? Plastics are essentially a byproduct. When oil refineries collect crude oil and process it into gasoline, the byproduct they create is a chemical polymer. These polymers are really large mo molecules, look like this, that are made up of a lot of other strings of smaller molecules that are all, bo that all bound together, sorry. Um, they are incredibly light, but they are incredibly strong and durable, which is why Depending on how these polymers are organized in these chains, that's how we get all of these different types of plastic that we see, all the way from saran wrap to the consistency of Tide bottles, all the way to uh, seats in um, like arenas and football stadiums. So all of those different plastics come from the same sort of polymers, but we just move them around every which way to create the different kind of plastics that serve our needs. So this is one reason why plastics have varying decomposition rates. So for example, if you were to put an apple core in the ocean, it would take probably about two months to fully decompose down to the chemical level where all of those chemicals are brought back into the natural system. However, if you're talking about a fishing line or a plastic bag, you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of years before those chemicals end up breaking down to their natural state. As a global society, we consume more plastic, more plastic today than any metal except for steel. The rise of plastics is, has been absolutely phenomenal. As a commodity on the market, it's only been around for about 65 years, um, yet the production now stands at about 6 billion metric tons, um, and half of that amount was made in the last 13 years. So we're seeing just an absolute incredible rise in the 
production and use of plastics in our daily life. And it's estimated that around the world, one million wa bottles of water are sold every minute. Um, so it's an incredible problem that is um, not slowing down anytime soon. And plastic production has taken over almost all medical production, unlike, but unlike metals, plastics have a very poor recycling rate. So in Europe, who we would consider like the quote unquote best recyclers, they still only recycle about 26% of the plastics that end up in their economy and in their lives. So many parts of the world, unlike Europe, don't have the waste management infrastructure, don't have recycling in infrastructure and the resources to have a, an infrastructure that can um, handle these materials being as pervasive as, the, as they are. So one answer to this question of where is all this plastic going if it's not being recycled, if it's not being reused, where is it? Well, all around the world, these materials are finding their way into our waterways, um, into our lakes, our rivers, our streams, at an alarming rate. So no matter where you live in the world, I always say all roads lead back to the ocean. So once it's in the water, where does it go? Well, we know that not all plastic floats, um, and certainly some of the missing plastic could be suspended in the water column or it could be on the floor, but um, it's difficult to learn where microplastics are because they're smaller than your finger and they can even be microscopic. Um, and ones that small end up being eaten by the lowest level of the food chain in the ocean, which ends up making its way to the highest level of the food chain, which is us. So the difficulties in determining the factors where all of this plastic is going is tremendous. It takes um, a level of systems thinking that is so incredibly macro and high level that we can't even um, conceive of all of the factors that go into how these break down. But I can say that one of the biggest reasons that plastic is uh, becoming such a big problem is because it breaks down in the ocean. So it breaks down due to salt water, wave action, direct sunlight and time. And it breaks down from a water bottle into tiny little microplastics over time. And we don't know how long that takes. It's different for every ocean. It's different for every temperature. It's different for every season. So it's impossible to say, um, you know, it's impossible to say lighter density plastics like water bottles, they'll always be floating or higher density uh, tide bottles are going to be sinking. So that's how we end up solving this problem. That's not the case because at every moment those densities are changing because they're breaking down due to these natural systems and breaking down into tiny little pieces that are harder to clean up than a water bottle, so to say. So one thing that we've seen probably a lot in the news, you've probably seen, are um, news of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Well, one thing we've seen is that this is in existence because plastic and garbage gets concentrated due to uh, where the ocean currents take the garbage. So the surface winds and currents end up gathering them into concentrated areas that are called gyres. And this is, these are what the ocean currents look like. And they end up feeding into gyres that are, there's five of them. So the one we hear the most about is the North Pacific because it's the largest. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But there's also four other ones that have um, just as much of concentrated plastic and garbage as the Great Pacific one. The uh, plane that I was talking about ended up being around this gyre. So as I mentioned, the largest is the Great Pacific, which I'm sure most of you heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. But it's actually two gyres that have combined into one, which is why it's so massive. Um, you have the east and the west that combine into one big vortex of um, trash, basically. Um, from there, newspapers I've seen have hung on to this headline of it's the size, the garbage is concentrated to the size of Texas or Alaska, but in reality, it's actually much larger than that because while it can be concentrated here, it's still here, it's still here, and it's still here. That's quite the problem. So a perfect example of how this works is what I call the, the Great Rubber Duck Incident of 1992. So in 1992, 29,000 plastic toys were spilled out of a ship coming from Hong Kong to the United States. And those ducks made, them, made their way out of these shipping containers and started a lovely adventure across the ocean. So they ended up being, started to be found, washed up in coastal areas on a lot of different continents and countries over a 15-year period. So 
uh, scientists and the media got together to sort of follow these rubber ducks so that they could start using new computer technology to create ocean current models. Um, and so they started using these ducks as uh, the example of these models. So they, uh, over the 15 years they found in 1993, started showing up around Alaska. And then by 1995, we started seeing them show up in Hawaii, in Japan, and then, of course, in Maine, which if you think if it spilled here and it made itself to Maine, that's quite the journey that that had to make. Um, but again, and the last one being in 2007, they found one in the United Kingdom. So they're still there, and they still look exactly like this, which means, which it also shows that these things um, travel, like this a little duck travels all the way across the world, but also... Um, that those plastics that that's made of is pervasive, and it made it 15 years in the ocean with all of the different factors of the wind, of the currents, of the salt water, and it still looks like a duck. So that's basically the sort of foundation of where plastic research in the ocean is. Um, the next step that researchers are doing right now is trying to figure out how much there is so that we can start creating some sort of a plan to figure out what we're dealing with. Um, the most recent study was conducted in um, 2015, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but we have to figure out, the way that science is going is we want to figure out how much enters the ocean every year instead of figuring out how much is already in the ocean. So it's important for us to figure out, basically, figure out what the faucet is doing instead of figuring out what the whole bathtub has in it so that we can start extrapolating out into the future what we expect those rates to be. And then we can also extrapolate backwards saying due to population, plastic pervasiveness, in the past we probably put this much in. So that's the way the research is going right now. The most recent study was done by Jenna Jambeck at the University of Georgia, who is my personal hero. Um, they worked to determine in 2015, they used data from 2010 to estimate all of these inputs around the world of how much plastic is flowing into our ocean from all of these different sectors. So what they ended up finding out, and this was published in Science, the Science uh, Magazine in 2015, and all of their, her data is in there. You can go and dig in if you have questions about it. But what she ended up finding with her team was there's about 8 million, it's 8.8 .8 million tons of plastic that's going into the ocean each year that we're missing from capturing it in recycling systems and things like that. So what they, so that is an incredible number, way more than we thought it would be. But even more stark was another fact that she found, which is based on um, the amount of plastics that we see when we go out into the ocean and we do net trawling and we um, count how much plastic is there and we extrapolate that number. So that amount is actually a lot less than the amount that's going into the ocean. So what she found was that even though 8.8 um, .8 million uh, tons are going into the ocean, there are, that it, there are 20 to 2,000 times as much in the ocean than we think there is. So it's an incredible problem. So then they extrapolated out um, in sort of the most... Uh, like exact way that they could, and they discovered that there's probably around 5.25 trillion pieces of plastic in the ocean alone, and that increases not only because we keep putting plastic in the ocean, but also because those b water bottles break down, and one water bottle could turn into 100 pieces of plastic over time. So we are on track right now. Um, she ended the paper talking about um, overfishing and population and then, uh, you know, ocean... Um, temperature rising. We are at now, like at this point, on track to have more plastic in our oceans than living creatures in the year 2050, which is in my lifetime, which is not great. So the study did not even account for other types of plastic inputs from activities like aquaculture, um, those shipping container losses, um, inputs from natural disasters, like what we saw with the tsunami in 2011 in Japan. Um, so there's still a discrepancy in how much is actually going into the ocean, but we're starting to dial in using accurate data to sort of figure out what this problem is. So the takeaway from this is that none of the biggest problems in the marine world is that there's a lot of it, there's more than we thought there was, it's a bigger problem than we thought, and it's going to last for a lot longer than we thought it would. So pretty dire. Um, so 
what I see, what I have here uh, is a picture of Earth at night. I'm sure most of us have seen this image. Um, but the arrows are pointing to remote islands that researchers have been going to to study the seabirds that live on that island and how many of them are dying with um, plastic ingested in their bellies and starving to death. So researchers are finding that an incredible percentage of birds that live far away from any human contact, places where humans don't go, are still ending up um, with massive casualties because they're eating plastic. And one example, oh, I should say. So the one I have circled here is called Henderson Island, and it's um, ran by Australia. But the island itself has 14 square miles, but it has now <laughs> earned the moniker as the, the dirtiest island in the world. Um, researchers went there, and they were astonished to find that there were 37 million pieces of garbage on this island, and it's 14 square miles. People don't live there. There's no industry there. It's literally a deserted island. Um, so it's pretty much a perfect uh, study for the accumulation rates of garbage on, on beaches. So every square mi meter, like every square meter of the beach had between 20 and 670 pieces of plastic on the surface. And then when you talk about going 10 to 20 centimeters into the sand where it gets buried, there were between 50 and 4,500 pieces buried underneath as well. So uh, researchers extrapolated this, cleaned the island, came back uh, 10 days later, cleaned it up again, counted all the numbers, and they have discovered that this island receives about 3,750 pieces of trash and plastic every single day on the shores. It's a much broader problem. And like I said, researchers thought that accumulation rates were uh, at a certain level, and this just shattered those numbers because it's just astronomical. And so then we're going to start talking about some of the dangers that this causes. So this is where some of the pictures get a little dicey. So marine life often become entangled in these plastic materials because they're so hardy, they're so pervasive, and it takes a lot to break them up. So we see a lot of um, you know, growing limitations, like what you see with this turtle here. And then we also see a lot of drowning and suffocation um, of animals that end up getting entangled in these ghost nets and other sorts of plastic that they can't themselves get out of. Um, and it's just tragic, because this is probably a 60-year-old turtle that ends up dying because it gets in a net. And there's also issues of increased vulnerability to predators, restricted movements, and exhaustion due to these sorts of materials. Another issue that they have is a lot of um, marine life are getting these new weird infections due to these sorts of limitations and the injuries they're getting from things that get entangled on them. Um, and so, I mean, we've all seen disaster movies. There could be some new bug or something that ends up being created during all of these um, issues, but something to think about. So like I mentioned, with those bird studies that they're doing on seabirds on remote islands, um, most of the animals, including seabirds especially, uh, eat plastic because it looks like the food that they're supposed to be eating. It looks like shrimp. It looks like squid. It looks like fish. Um, and so they end up filling their stomachs with plastic. They don't feel hungry because they're full, but they're not getting any nutrients, so they end up dying of starvation. And this is the biggest example of this that we're seeing, like physically the biggest and also numerically the biggest, are uh, whales. So we have uh, a lot of whales that are um, showing up on shores, uh, and researchers are cutting them open, seeing what's inside, and they're finding thousands of plastic materials inside their stomachs. So again, they feel full, but they don't have any nutrients, so they end up starving to death. So um, an issue with this is plastics are manufactured with a variety of um, additives, which could be toxic. I know if um, you guys have followed the news in the past 10 or 15 years, BPAs in water bottles ended up being a, a, ma a major issue. Um, but there's other sort of um, toxins in plastic as well that we haven't seen those effects of yet. So not only are those there, but those polymers end up attracting and acting as sponges for other toxins that are in the ocean. So we all remember DDT. We all remember PCBs. Those, didn't, those chemicals didn't disappear. They're still in the ocean floating around. These plastic pieces act as magnets and sponges just because of the way the, chemi the chemistry attracts them so that the pieces of plastic here end up with DDT, PCBs, BPAs, a lot of different toxins that end up getting eaten by plankton, that end up getting eaten by fish, 
by the large predator like a tuna, which we end up eating. So we effectively are eating all of the toxins that are in here in the bioaccumulation of that. This is a very active area of research right now. So um, a smaller danger, but still one that we need to be aware of, is uh, the danger of invasive species. California's dealing with this quite a bit. Same with the coast of Canada, uh, because a lot of tsunami um, uh, trash has ended up coming. It's been in the ocean for eight, nine years at this point. If you've seen Blue Planet with Dave Attenborough, he talks about um, the way that organisms in the ocean create micro ecosystems with floating trash, debris, um, and floating matter. So they can travel hundreds of miles and they can end up attracting a lot of barnacles and things that are not um, supposed to be in different areas. And they can really cause devastating impacts on fisheries, on local ecosystems. They're incredibly costly to eradicate. We still can't eradicate the Asian carp, for example, here in the Midwest. So um, imagine this on a, on a larger scale. So there's a lot. I want to switch over to some solutions, because it's not all doom and gloom. There's people out there trying to do stuff. Um, one of the ways that we're trying to uh, fix this problem is by turning the plastic in the ocean into things. So Adidas uh, has created, and Nike too now, have created shoes out of the ocean plastic that they, has been collected. Method has made a soap container out of all of these plastics. There's a brewery in uh, Florida who has created and patented a biodegradable six ring pack holder that um, fish can eat or it just biodegrades so it no longer becomes um, an entanglement issue with them. So there's a lot of work being done there. But I think the one that you've probably all heard about or read about is the Ocean Project with the really enigmatic um, boy in slot who in 2012, he went to the TEDx event in Delft and he uh, proposed at 18 years old that he could create a, a floating boom like you see here that uses ocean currents to move and then um, suck up trash and trap it there. So then, if you talk to the experts, um, when I first heard about it, I thought there's no way that's gonna work, but he was very passionate about it. He was certain it was going to. So there were a lot of concerns with the design as well as the implementation. And so, uh, I wanna be positive. I'm gonna think about the positive side of it, which is that he, ended up bringing this to an, to an international conversation. Um, so he's brought a lot of attention to the um, to marine debris itself, as well as the fact that um, he's out there raising money to fund the creation of this sort of thing. So if you're thinking about the value of this problem environmentally, he's put a dollar on it so far of being a $40 million problem, but it's probably in the billions and billions. So at least he's bringing attention to it. But again, it's not being successful. It keeps breaking. They have to keep fixing it. It keeps breaking again. Um, it doesn't require us. And the biggest problem that we have in the environmental world with this device, I mean, we want to clean up the ocean. We really want to. But we really need to change our actions first because we are basically not turning off the faucet and letting the bathtub fill up and up and up. So we need to turn off the faucet first. So. Again, um, experts throughout the entire time Boyan has been working on this, we've been like, well, you know, if it could be done, we'd have done it already, but keep working at it. So he's trying. I hope he proves us wrong, honestly. And the biggest problem with this gadget is because while it's important to go out and get the Coca-Cola bottles that are floating along the top of the ocean, this is the water we need to clean. This is the, um, the water looks like with, this was taken from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch at about 20 meters deep, and so that's what the water looks like. It's all those microplastics floating. And so to capture that sort of, um, these sort of materials without capturing the plankton that we need to support uh, marine life, it's, a, it's very difficult to do. And again, uh, we also don't want to end up like the whales and the turtles that we've, and the birds that we've seen pictures of, but we're going to if we continue the cycle of um, allowing these macroplastics to um, exist. So where do we go, and how does Iowa come into play with this sort of conversation? Um, every study that I've looked at, majority of the garbage and the waste that ends up in the ocean comes from inland. It doesn't come from people who live on the ocean. So the areas in red here that we see 
are all of the tributaries and rivers and lakes that feed into the Mississippi that goes to the Gulf. So when we're talking about what do we have to bring to the table when it comes to talking about garbage and waste in the ocean, I think we have a much larger impact than we uh, give ourselves credit for here in the Midwest. And I'm making it my personal mission by the time that I expire from this earth that we are going to be considered a marine environment here in the Midwest because we really have a lot to play, especially if you look at nitrates and stuff in dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico. We play a really big part in that too. So we are trying to do our part here in Iowa. Um, there's a lot of cleanups that happen along rivers um, all across the state, pretty much any time it's warm out. Um, in 2017, we did a 10-mile cleanup of the Iowa River, and we collected 13.8 tons of materials that we ended up getting recycled and processing. So it's about a ton per mile in our rivers of garbage that we're collecting. Um, I remember when, so I absolutely helped out with this event. and. The river was incredibly low that July when we did this, and I ended up pulling out things like a really, really old sewing machine, a 1990s boombox, a baseball that I still have, and a washing machine from the 70s. I kid you not, a washing machine. A lot of crawdads were mad at me. So these events across Iowa and the Midwest happen all summer. I implore you, if you can, if at all possible, please take um, advantage of them and help out. But however, we do see, as we continue to see an increase in flooding and then just the veracity of the flooding being worse every time it floods, we're going to con continue seeing issues like this. So with flooding, this is a picture taken of the Cedar Rapids train bridge in 2008. So this can't get more close to home. So when waters recede, cleanup began, and we started seeing images like this. But if this bridge hadn't been there, all of these materials would have made their way down to the ocean. So I want to talk a little bit about systemic and institutional um, changes that we're making to sort of uh, try and fix this problem. Iowa is actually doing quite a bit when it comes to um, institutional change. So we have, we're one of 10 states in the United States that have the bottle bill. And I know it can be a contentious issue when you're talking about, but in 1978, we enacted the law and we made sure that when a consumer buys uh, beer, carbonated soft drink, mineral water, wine coolers, soft drinks, and uh, liquor, then they can return those f for the five cents at a different redemption center. So this is actually an incredibly successful program where the uh, bottles that have the five cent return end up getting returned at an 86% recycling rate, which is incredible. And the quality of the plastic in the glass that gets turned in is a lot better than that which is not. So recyclers love the bottle bill. So the goal was to reduce like litter and then reduce our consumption of natural resources so we can use plas reuse plastics. But a secondary benefit that we're starting to see sociologically is that there is a mental shift in people's perception of bottles in Iowa. So people see them as a commodity, as money. Um, so they collect it. They turn it back in, and that's something that we'd like to see over the entire waste stream, not just you know plastic bottles and stuff. But there's a lot of room for improvement, and so we're talk there's a lot of talk in Iowa about getting rid of it, and I am on the other side of that pendulum where I think we should expand it, because this bill was created before water bottles were really um, quite the thing. And so a lot of, I think we should have um, this bottle bill for bottled water. I do recognize there's socioeconomic issues with that as well as you know environmental impacts, but the conversation about expanding this bill should definitely be started. And all of these solutions so far that I've talked about are all consumer driven. So it's us, the consumers, going, this is an issue, how do we fix it? So the next step in altering the system and one that I'm gonna spend my life trying to, to advocate for um, is holding the producers of these materials responsible for what they're creating and putting into the economy and our natural environment. So this is pretty radical, but we've done it before, honestly. So in the 70s, with um, lovely Richard Nixon creating the EPA, we decided that we should hold um, those accountable um, using a law called RICRA. Those who create toxic and hazardous materials, every time they sell those materials, they should pay a little bit extra in a tax, like 1%. And that 1% goes into a giant pot of money that when inevitably these spill or these get um, you know, 
dispersed into the environment and we have a toxic and hazardous waste site, the Superfund program will come in with the money that the producers put into this pot because they created this, these terrible materials and clean up those and remediate those, um, those hazardous waste sites. So my question that I have is, how is that any different than um, creating these, this uh, giant environmental issue that is having pretty similar environmental impacts as hazardous and toxic waste does globally? Um, why can't we hold producers to that same standard that we did in the 70s? But that's pretty radical. So now more than ever, it's important to ask these questions because if you've read any of the news lately, you know that we are in the middle of this garbage marketplace shift. So the reason that recycling exists, the reason that this sort of market exists is because there's companies that buy the product that are, that are redeemed and that are collected. So one of the biggest buyers of these materials were companies in China. But in 2018, China decided that they were not going to accept any more plastic imported. So for 2018, they stopped importing plastic and so then they uh, did the math, and in 2018, they imported 99.1% less plastic than they did in 2017, the exact year before. So they really are holding um, true to their word that they're not taking any more plastics. And then in the, at the end of 2018, so starting now, they are no longer taking plastics, but they also won't take metal scraps, scrap vessels, scrap automobile, industrial waste, um, stainless steel, wood waste. They're really cutting down on the imports of garbage because it's an, it's an incredible environmental uh, hazard for the country itself. And they're also creating a bunch of new recycling centers so that they can process the garbage and stuff that they make in their own country. It's, it's quite insane. So it's in, not insane, but amazing. So then recovered plastic shipments, again, um, were way down from 2017, the year before, um, which is incredible. And uh, historically, China has always been the receiver of a lot of the world's plastic as well as electronic waste. Um, and so the world never had to find alternatives. Um, if there's someone to take it, why do we need to stop or why do we need to come up with a different way? Um, and as you can see here, China really was taking a lot of the brunt of um, global plastics. But when you talk about who creates the plastic that ends up getting shipped to China or a different country, it, it's definitely inequitable. So we have a lot of first world countries that are creating this garbage that is hoping to send it off to someone else to take care of. So um, from there, right now, by definition, and I don't want to shock anybody, still recycle, use your curbside, but right now, the, what we refer to as recyclable materials are now garbage because there's no market for them. We're shuttling and shuffling around to try and find people to take the garbage that we're creating. Um, and one thing that we kind of predicted would happen, and it actually is now that it's been a year into this process where they were not accepting any more plastic, is other countries in other areas that have a lower and a quieter political voice are now taking on the brunt of the, the waste. So we're just finding other people who won't tell us no um, to shift the environmental burden of having all of these plastics. So um, as I think I've kind of hammered the point in home, the only real solution we have is we have to stop using plastic. We have to stop creating it. Um, we have to start managing it properly. We have to um, improve our waste management systems, the infrastructure, the collection. Um, it's the only way we're really going to solve this problem. And um, we really need that to happen. But on top of that, even before we can do that, we have to have a social and cultural change and mind shift into away from single use plastics back to things that are reusable um, and that don't impact our environment as much. And so by changing the way that we think about plastic and garbage, and if we start valuing these materials on a commodity market, which is what they are, then we can start uh, creating new jobs. The reason China is not accepting any more garbage and plastic is because they're creating their own internal structures. They're creating 25 new recycling plants and incinerators so that they can deal with their own garbage in their own country. And we need to start doing things like that. There's a lot of room for innovation, like Boy and Slot coming up with $40 million to clean up the ocean. There's a lot of technical and um, economic innovation that can happen if we decide to start tackling this problem head on. And then I also think um, the 70s was also the time we created Reduce, Reuse, Recycle, along with the time of only you can prevent forest fires. So uh, at that time, 
we weren't really thinking of expanding it, but now that plastics are so pervasive and such a problem, we really do need to focus on a lot of different um, options, like rethinking even using plastic at all, refusing straws, refusing uh, plastic forks, keep a fork in your desk at work, uh, reduce the amount that you do use, make sure to reuse what you can, repair and repurpose your electronics and all of these other devices that you don't need to throw away, but that can be fixed. And then if there's no other option for you at that point, then recycle. So from that point on, I think we can do questions, I think. Uh, first question, why doesn't Iowa expand the bottle bill to include more categories of bottle, bottles, such as juice bottles and water bottles? Great question. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the reason that we won't is because there's just a giant lobby that's against in expanding that bottle bill. So it's not just um, the beverage and bottling companies, but it's also uh, Coca-Cola, it's also Dasani. It's the companies that argue that that extra five cents will mean that people can't have clean water. They make that sort of argument rather than saying um, you can get that five cents back if you return it. So it's basically just political um, and using the argument that it's making their product more expensive and people are already paying, you know, so much for everything. So that's basically why. Are there really compost compostable uh, plastic bags? Yes. They're, well, not, they're not plastic bags then at that point. Um, plastic is not compostable. It's not degradable, like I've um, mentioned in this. So there are no plastic compostable bags, but there are compostable bags that mimic plastic bags. That makes sense. When plastic is recycled, um, how much of it is actually turned into a new product? A lot less than 100%. Um, glass is the only, glass and steel are really the only two materials that uh, can, when melted back down, be remolded into the exact a different product or the same product and maintain 100% of its chemical property. So plastic, different kinds. So the rougher, thicker plastic, um, I should back up and say, plastic itself can never be made thicker. It can only be detracted and made thinner. So if you have a, um, tied detergent um, plastic, for example, and you go and you melt that down and you want to turn it to something else, it's probably be going to be something that's like a quarter or half as thick. Whereas if you start with a comb, a plastic comb, you might be able to get a plastic bag out of that, but maybe not. So it degrades over 50% of the plastic, the chemical composition, which is why another argument we make for not recycling is that it's incredibly resource intensive. It takes a lot of water to recycle and you have a byproduct of all of these polymers that you now need to deal with um, figuring out a way to not throw them into, back into the environment, but figure out a way to um, yeah, have them because it's just the byproduct of that. So good question. What do you suggest uh, to replace single use plastics? glass. Um, I would say um, things that are naturally generated, like compostable um, plates, bowls, cups. Uh, the number one thing that we see um, in the ocean are straws and forks. So if we were to make those things require those things to be compostable or just require people to have their own straws or not use straws, then we would cut down on a lot of the issues that we see of them per pervading in the environment. Um, but yeah, I think it would be awesome if we could just make it everything compostable, because then when, even if it does end up in the landfill, it's something that can be processed naturally by the um, biological agents in a landfill. Uh, similar question, what recommendations do you have regarding purchasing products made from recycled plastics? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's hard. Um, I can see both sides of the argument on that. I would say mostly just try not to buy things. Um, the con movement of consumerism in the 50s is what got us to where we are today. So if we could go back to not requiring things that are made out of plastic or buying things that we don't need, um, that's kind of the ideal. But I see both sides of that one. Are there chemical reactions that can decompose plastics? Uh, are there bacterial agents? 
They're testing. They're definitely testing those on um, some of the lighter, more flexible plastics. Um, they're finding bacteria that will eat some of the chemical agents within them. But when it gets down to the polymer level, it's harder for bacteria to want to um, sort of take that on. So they're working on it. Um, I'm just afraid that they're going to create some sort of super bug that ends up taking over Earth, but <laughs> I've seen too many movies. <laughs> Uh, what role do corporations play in the marine waste problem? Uh, do they contribute more waste or environmental harm than the consumers? Yeah, I mean, it's a give and take there, but I would say if it's give and take, it's 80-20, um, consumer being 20%, corporations being 80. Um, there's just a, a giant uh, web of ways that they influence your purchasing power as well as the way that they make their products. Um, and the fact that we're a capitalist-driven country where we value profit over everything else. Um, I do think it is give and take. Um, I do think that we would stop, like corporations would stop creating plastic water bottles or, um, you know, they stopped putting uh, BPAs in our plastic bottles because people said we won't buy that anymore. So if we, as a consumer, were to stand up and say we're not doing this anymore, I do think there would be... Um, a little bit more attention focused on other solutions. But I do think if you're talking about how much they play as a role in this problem, it's definitely way more than a majority. So. Um, it sounds like biodegradable plastics are not a solution. Do we need a flotilla of garbage collecting ships and would that ever make uh, a dent in the problem? Um, it then, then follows up, need to turn off the faucet first, don't we? That's what I was going to say. Um, definitely turn off the faucet first, but we do need to come up with a way to clean up what's in the ocean because while we think we have a handle of how much is out there, we don't, and we don't know how it will be um, reacting to the natural environment in 20 years. So we only know the research we've done over the past 30 and 40 years and what plastic looks, looks like now, but we have no idea what that's going to look like in the future. Um, does that answer the question? It's a topic that you didn't directly um, touch on yet, and that is uh, foam containers. Um, can you talk a little bit about foam containers, um, any push um, nationally or internationally um, to um, outlaw those? Um, so. Oh, foam. Styrofoam. Yeah. Oh, yes. like, foam, foam, foam. Sorry. Yeah, no, styrofoam. So, uh, yeah, the, I mean, styrofoam containers are becoming less and less used because people end up heating up their food or whatever they end up getting with it. And then the chemical reaction of the heat with the plastic in the styrofoam ends up causing cancers and things like that. So also never heat up plastic. Don't take it out, put it on glass before you microwave anything. Um, so right. What was it? What was the question? I just got on a tangent there. Yeah. Uh, it's the question of oh, just, in, yeah, styrofoam. styrofoam. Got it. Okay. So there has been less and less styrofoam used in, at least in the first world countries, when it comes to single-use food containers. But in the third world, they're still very relevant and prevalent there because it's cheaper than paper. It's cheaper than um, compostable materials when it comes to package or food, single-use food containers. But when it comes to packaging material, like computers and things that people buy that come packaged, um, there's still an increasing rise of that. Um, and I... There's absolutely no way to recycle styrofoam. It has to go straight to the landfill. Um, they haven't figured out a way to scientifically do that yet. So I wish there was more of a push. There's a push on the food side, but mostly because, again, the chemical reaction of heat with that styrofoam into food was causing cancer among people. So that sort of drove that change, but we're not seeing that change in packaging material. So. Uh. A couple more questions. Uh, we you talked a little bit about the plastic ingested by um, marine life, but what about when the human eats the marine life? Is there any studies uh, on that or any impact on the human population? Yeah. Sorry. I mean, we don't even have to talk about um, marine debris. We can talk about mercury. Um, the big scare everyone had with eating tuna and raw fish in, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago was because there was mercury in the ocean. Plankton ate mercury. Fish ate plankton. Dolphins ate fish, right? Or tuna ate fish. And so we were eating uh, the biomass of all of those material, like all of those animals in that food web. Um, all of those, all that mercury, all those marine, that marine waste carries up into the food chain. It doesn't disappear. So 
we as the top of that food chain will be eating all of the things that that um, those animals ate. So it's a pretty big issue. There's not a lot of studies done yet because the effects of um, these polymers and, P and BPAs and PCBs on our internal systems takes so long to um, start showing. So it's not like mercury poisoning where it's a little bit more rapid if you have that happening, but instead with this sort of plastic pollution in our bodies, it takes a lot longer for our, those to affect the way um, our body works. So I would say in the next 30 years, we'll probably start seeing a lot more um, and we'll look back and think, how did I ever touch a plastic bottle ever or whatever? But um, yeah, as of now, it's still, we're still waiting to see what those effects are. The so last question, it's more of a suggestion. What is a good, relatively easy strategy, one strategy that all of us can take away today to reduce our, our plastic use and um, pass on to our families and friends? Hmm. Um, I think something that is easier to do would be just stop drinking bottled water. Um, the water we have here is great. I mean, it has its issues, but it's better than it's ever been. Uh, and there's n really no reason to buy bottled water. It is not um, regulated by the FDA as a food. It is not regulated in that way. So it's not required to go through the rigorous testing that other types of food that um, companies sell have to go through. So um, you can even look this up. 93% of bottled water has microplastics in it as of right now. And, some com and there's some that are better. Um, and there's like San Pellegrino. Uh, it's got maybe 10% of their bottles have plastic in them, but then um, a couple, if you go up to Spring Valley, that one has like 95% of their um, water bottles have microplastics in them. So for a lot of reasons, we should not be drinking and continuing to promote this um, water bottle industry, but also we do need to recognize the socioeconomic um, situation with that in like Flint, for example. Um, so that's recognizing that. And then, so that one's that. And then I think second of all, stop using straws. We don't need them. Third of all, um, if you can, take reusable containers to the grocery store and buy bulk. So if you're getting oatmeal, if you're getting um, you know, flour or anything, you can take a container and fill it up in the bulk section so that you're not introducing more waste and stuff into your own home waste stream. And the grocery stores here have made that incredibly easy to do if you come in with those containers, um, and then that can actually make a pretty big impact. So. Why are those companies not regulated? Which ones? The ones that... The water bottle? Water bottle. Because water, I can't remember which, the, the FDA doesn't regulate it as a food. And so if it's a food, there's so many rules and stuff they have to follow, and quality, and um, like, source chain so that's why a lot of water bottle or water bottle companies get away with selling tap water is because there's no regulation over the source of their water because it's not a food it's regulated as um something else i can't remember i'm gonna think of it on the walk back and driving nuts but it's regulated as something else where the restrictions of what goes into it and the oversight into the actual industry is a lot lower uh, we now conclude our program and i want to give a big thank to blake roop for her presentation oh, thank you guys. And I also want to thank our sponsors again, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. And again, today's special sponsors, Pat and Jim Fgraf, the University of Iowa Community Credit Union, and Hazel Seba. And of course, thank City Channel 4 for making our programs available. And as a small token of our appreciate, appreciation, we're going to present you with our coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations mug, not plastic. Yay, great. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.